He got a nice Christmas hat. Don't he look good? Well, today we are going to tell you the story of how Jesus healed a blind man from John 9. So you just sit back and hold on to your saddles while we take you back in time by my time machine to the time of Jesus. Lester, where is that back in time button? Yeah, I think it's this one. Oh, oh yeah. Here we go. I'm blind and I can't see. Please help me. Please give me money. Please give me money. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus, who said this man or his parents that he was born blind? Neither. This happened so that the work of God could be displayed in his life. I'm going to spit on the ground and make mud and put it on his eyes. Go, wash in the pool, and you'll be able to see. I can see! I can see! Thank you, Jesus! I can see! Thank you! Tell me again, how were you healed? I'm a Pharisee, you better tell the truth. By Jesus! He came, he spit on the ground, he made some mud, he wiped it in my eyes, and he told me to go wash. Jesus is a bad man. He couldn't have done this. Plus, I don't really think you were born blind. Where are his parents? Tell me, was your son born blind? Yes, and I don't know how he was healed. Tell me again, how were you healed? I told you, Jesus. Do you want to be his disciple too? How dare you lecture me, all of you, out? There you are, Jesus! I believe you are the Son of God! Thank you for healing me! You had a tough life being blind, but actually, you were born blind, so I could heal you and show everybody the power of God! Because of this blind man, I believe in you, Jesus! Yes! Now, Lester, what passage does that story remind you of? This one, Paul, it says, In all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. In Romans 8.28 the, the blind man had it tough, but he loved God, so everything worked out for the good. 
That's exactly right. Lots of people came to believe in Jesus because of that blind man. Now, Chester, has anything bad ever happened to you that God worked out for the good? <laughs> That's a great story. Old Chester, he says that when he was in his second grade, he got picked on by another horse. <laughs> but he felt so bad because of that. And in junior high school, he saw another horse getting picked on, and he knew he was feeling bad. So he went over and became best horse in the <laughs> that guy. Yes, sir. That wouldn't have happened without him being picked on in second grade. So children, if something bad happens to you, I want you to remember that God will work that out for something good. You just keep on loving God and see what great things he does. This is Fester and Lester and Chester <laughs> saying goodbye. Morning, church. My name is Martin, and this is my amazing wife, Amber, and we're here to welcome you to the uh, Sunday service of the Detroit Church of Christ. Um, I'd like to share a quick scripture with you. In 1 Peter 1, 
verse 3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So um, we're about to round the corner from 2020 into 2021. And I feel like a lot of us can agree that the year of 2020 was a rough one. And we're all really anxious for just a new beginning and a new start. And um, that's one of the things I really love about this scripture is that with Jesus in our life, we don't have to wait until the end of a new year to have another start. You know, with having Jesus in our lives, every day is a new beginning, every day is a new start, and every day he has a new hope for us. Um, and so I really hope that that gives you encouragement, just not only going into the new year, but just with every day that you wake up, knowing that it can be a beautiful, fresh, new day full of hope with our Lord. And with that, we're going to go ahead and go to God in prayer. Dear amazing God, thank you so much for this amazing time with you, God, uh, with our amazing brothers and sisters. Uh, I pray that church can go well. I pray that everybody's holidays went absolutely amazing, God. Mm -hmm. And I pray that the new year brings in new hope, uh, new renewal, God. Um, and not just that, but every single day that we can be shining lights for everybody in the world, God. We love you, God. We thank you, God. It's in your sons and we pray. We love you, church. Love you guys. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good morning, everyone. My name is Corinne and welcome to Corinne's Corner. So the other day I was doing laundry and I don't know about you, but laundry has to be one of my least favorite chores to do, but they had to get done. So I loaded up my clothes in the washing machine and some time passed and it was time to transfer my clothes into the dryer. But instead of doing that, although I had the time and although I had the energy, I decided to do something else. I was like, ah, I'll just get to that whenever I get to it. And you can probably predict what happened next. I'm not gonna tell you how much time passed because that would be too embarrassing. But enough time passed that when I finally went to the washing machine, my clothes smelled horrible. It was awful. And I asked myself, why didn't I just transfer the clothes when I had the time? Why didn't I transfer the clothes when I had the energy? And now I'm paying the consequences. My clothes are stinky. And it made me think, I think this can be reflected in other areas of my life. I also don't love having hard conversations with people. 
I don't, I just don't like conflict. And sometimes when I do have to engage in a hard conversation with someone, I tend to make excuses because I just don't want to do that. I don't want to engage in that at all. And it made me think of this scripture. In Proverbs 3, starting at verse 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. And this, script, this scripture was super encouraging and a helpful reminder for me that when I trust God and I lean not on my own understanding and when I get advice, God is going to make my path straight and things are going to be so much better and probably way less stinky. I hope this has been encouraging to you guys and I hope you guys have a great rest of your service. I pray that you have enjoyed the service so far and hope that everyone had a great holiday. My name is Clifton Brent. I'm married to my lovely wife, Mayan, who makes it all happen. Our son, Caleb, who is in New York, and my second favorite young lady in the world, only second to her mom, my daughter, Michaela. I'm honored to be able to talk about how wonderful God is today and always. As a church, we've been doing a series in this month of December titled Staying the Course. And today my title will be Staying the Course when you're tired of the battle. And at this point in time, I would like to share a short story for you about gratitude. A blind boy sat on the steps of a building with a hat by his feet. He held up a sign which read, I am blind, please help. There were only a few coins in the hat, spare change from folks as they hurried past, a man was walking by. He took a few coins from his pocket and dropped them into the hat. He then took the sign, turned it around, and wrote some words. Then he put the sign back in the boy's hand so that everyone who walked by would see the new words. Soon the hat began to fill up. A lot more people were giving money to the blind boy. 
That afternoon, the man who had changed the sign returned to see how things were. The boy recognized his footsteps and asked, Were you the one who changed my sign this morning? What did you write? The man said, I only wrote the truth. I said what you said, but in, different w but in a different way. I wrote, Today is a beautiful day, but I cannot see it. Both signs spoke the truth, but the first sign simply said the boy was blind, while the second sign conveyed to everyone walking by how grateful they should be to see. We should be very grateful to be able to see. And just even just to see what God is doing in our lives. 2020 has been a tough year. It's been a tough year for so many of us. I could probably even say probably all of us. <laughs> But I had a chance to talk with two individuals this past week or so. One was a really good friend of mine I grew up with and, my, and one of my sisters. And I asked just two different questions. I want to know if they could describe this year, 2020, in one word. And what are you hopeful for in 2021? My friend said the word that he would come up with would be perseverance. He said, this year alone has been one of anguish, fear, and, and uncertainty. But if nothing else, it's taught me to remain steadfast in my commitment to helping one another. And he said, I'm hopeful that everyone will come out of 2020 with a renewed sense of what's most important. And we bring those values into the future. After talking with my sister, she said in a few words, she said, it has been a year of missing. I said, interesting. She said, as my granddaughter so aptly put it, missing friends and family and life events, missing traditions and making new memories, missing feelings of well-being, joy, safety. She said, all of these are important and necessary to, a live, to living a good and healthy life. When things go missing in our lives, we are unanchored. And she said, I am hopeful for the return of civility and calm that once again, we feel joy and hope and love as everyday experiences in our lives. I am hopeful that we will remember 2020 and commit to living lives of gratitude. I am hopeful that we will have learned to take nothing for granted. I am hopeful that what went missing in 2020 will be restored on both a personal and on a national level. So I really had a great time just chatting with the two of them and just getting their perspective on 2020 and us getting ready to go into the new year. I truly believe God has a plan for us. And just like we talked about the title of just staying the course when you're tired of the battle. How many of us here can raise our hand and say, man, I'm tired of this year. <laughs> it's okay. And then I would like to even ask a question. What battle is making you weary right now? If you work in an environment where everything is affirmed except faith in Christ, you may find that over time, the ongoing erosion of an increasingly hostile culture begins to wear you down. If you're going through a stale time in your marriage of, of facing difficulties with a rebellious son or daughter, you may find that over time, your energy drains and it is harder to keep going. Or just maybe you have been battling against a particular sin and for a while you made progress but then the old temptation reared its ugly head and having falling again. It's hard to find the energy to get up and press on. Or perhaps after serving in the ministry for some time. And serving in the ministry doesn't mean full-time ministry. It means loving God and loving people. Maybe you're, you're, you, you lead a Bible talk, you lead a house church, or you, you oversee a zone, or, or you even oversee a church. You feel that you are running out of steam. Anyone who serves God with all of their heart, wholeheartedly, will know what it is to come to a place of saying, I don't know 
how much longer I can do this. So how do you stay the course when you're tired of the battle? Let's look over in Acts chapter 17, verses 5 and 10. But the other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and si Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. In verse 10, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. See, the church in Thessalonica was born in great difficulties. Some bad characters started a riot, and Paul had to leave the city during the night, knowing that they may never be able to see the brothers and sisters who profess faith through his ministry again. Let's turn, if you will, over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13. It says, and as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. See, Paul wrote two letters to the Thessalonians. And in the first, he, he grounds these believers in their newfound faith. And in the second, that he had written sometime later, he focuses in on what it takes to persevere. He said, never tire of doing what is right gets to the heart of Paul's message in the second letter. The big question to you is how and how can I never tire? How can I go the distance as a Christian? How can I have patience with my children and perseverance in my job or even in my ministry? See, there is a marvelous nugget at the beginning of Second Thessalonians that helped me when I saw it and has continued to help me, especially when I get tired of the battle. Paul says over and talks about over in Second Thessalonians chapter one, verses three and four. Paul says, your faith is growing more and more and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance. See, there's a helpful old adage that when you see the word, therefore, you should ask what it's there for. And in this case, it is making connection that is especially important. The faith of these people is growing and in their love for each other is increasing. And therefore, Paul boasts about their perseverance. See, perseverance is the is the fruit of growing in faith and in increasing in love. Deepening your faith and renewing your love will enable you to stay the course even when you are tired of the battle. See, this connection is evident from even other scriptures as well. I think first about love. See, love is patient. By nature, it always perseveres. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 and 7. So when I need more patience with other people, the way to get it is by loving them more. I once had a conversation with a leader who had led family groups for many years, back 27 years ago. I was probably three years as a, as a Christian. He was tired. And when he met, when we met for breakfast, he told me he felt it was time to move on. There was some, some sadness about the way he spoke. And so I asked, <laughs> if you know me, I'm always asking questions. So I asked him questions that, that led him to telling me about his frustration with, with just various people in the group. And after listening for a while, I said to him, I think you are tired of these people. And here's what I would like for you to do. That's if you're willing, if it's okay with you. I said, I want you to go to God. Ask him to renew your love for them. Pray for them and see if God will rekindle the affection you have for them before. He looked at me with glossy eyes. And he said, Cliff, I think I will do that. And we agreed to meet again in a month. And when we did, he told me that he had been renewed and refreshed and had completely changed his mind about stepping, stepping down from leading the group. What happened was both simple and wonderful. Increasing love had led to perseverance. See, growing in faith also produces perseverance, making it possible to stay the course when you're tired of the battle. As it is 
in the nature of grass to grow, so it is in the nature of faith to persevere. So true. I found that the times when I get jaded and discouraged usually turn out to be times when I have lost sight of what the Lord is doing or lost confidence in what he is able to do in my own life and in the lives of the people I serve. I've got a short story here I would like to share with you about my daughter, Michaela. If many people know us, our, our daughter Michaela went to a boarding school for high school about three hours from here in the state of Ohio. And um, she did many sports from track and field to volleyball to basketball to softball, did many sports. But this one particular sport story I'd like to share with you about was, was one of her volleyball games. It was during the middle of the week and my wife and I, we got in the car and we drove up three hours to see this game. I was going to watch the game for a couple of hours and drive back. This was a tough game. We knew it was a big game for them. This was a team that was undefeated, but not only just undefeated, but they just had phenomenal girls on this team that has been together for that three, four years, whatever it been. I mean, just they're tall and, and confident and and all of that you know five nine five eleven there's even there was even two or three that was roughly six six one but they were they were tough but you know sometimes you come into a situation already feel feeling defeated and that's where Michaela and the team was they were defeated One thing I learned from this, from her and her team early on in the game is that no matter what, they were going to have fun. And I learned a lot from that because you can have fun, play games, do whatever you want, but just have fun. It's not always about winning, but I know that's tough for me because I want to have fun and I want to win because I believe winning is having fun. <laughs> But that was a valid lesson for me. But these girls knew they were good. They had a certain walk to them. And you know, when you know you're good and you got this, this undefeated record of, I think it was 9-0 and or 11-0, and whatever their record was, they knew they were good and they had a certain walk to them. I even think about, before I get, get deep into Michaela's story, I even think about, about golf. I love to golf. I'm not that great at golf. But I love to golf. And we've got a few brothers right here in the church that are pretty good at golfing. I think about a David Tracy, who's just a big hitter. I think about a Mike Banks, who's just a overall, just a, a pretty good golfer. Hits good off the tee, short game, put it. It's just a good golfer. And then Prince Teta, who's just a solid golfer. And I tell you, when I get the opportunity to play these guys, and I beat them, I have a certain walk to me. It's very rare, but when I do, I strut <laughs> because it's an accomplishment. I've won. And so back to the volleyball. So the first game, and usually when they play, it's three out of five, three, the best three out of the five games. First game, the team slaughtered them. 25 to 9. Second game, they got a little bit better. 25 to 11. And I couldn't sit still. I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm antsy. I'm, I'm moving around and my wife could see it. And I look back at the parents and some of the parents were disgruntled and, and just, just not right. <laughs> but no one wanted to say anything. And I looked at my wife. I said, I'm going over. She said, what are you doing? The coach is there. She's coaching. I said, I just want to see if I can say a few words. She said, oh, my goodness. And I did. I trotted across the floor. And I looked at the coach. She looked at me. And I said, do you mind if I just say something to the team? She said, wow, be my guest. So her thinking at that point in time was like, if, if, anything, just give me anything if it will help. And so I rallied the girls around. And I said, listen, okay, you've got a good team here. Yes, we know that. But guess what? You guys are not playing up to your potential. 
You've got to go inside of you and bring it out. I want you starting right now to dig deep inside of you and go back out these last three games and give it all that you have. Don't leave anything here on the sideline. Leave it all on the court. And I said, and see what happens. Remember, you have a team here. Play together, communicate. Let's just watch and see what happens. I said, bring it in here. I said, on three, we're going to say dig deep. One, two, three. Dig deep. And that was the chant from that point on. Dig deep. Dig deep. I went back over to the bleachers and I shared it with the parents. And that was the theme for the rest of the night. And honestly, guys, they won the next three games. It did something to their faith. It did something to their spirit. It lifted them like you never would know. And seeing that connection is really helpful because it points to answer, renew confidence in God, even with us spiritually. And all that he is able to do in you and through you will help you persevere, even when you are tired of the battle. I share this with my house church about three weeks ago, I said, don't ask God to guide your footsteps if you're not willing to move your feet. And as we reflect back on this year, 2020, and the lessons we heard this month, staying the course by checking up on each other, staying the course by not checking out mentally, still there but not checked out, staying the course by checking in with Jesus, that's a good place to start, I believe. And then stay in the course, even when you're tired of fighting or just tired of the battle. I have a friend at work, a young engineer who's even watching this right now, who's working on a project. Sometimes it gets tough. We talk all the time. I say to him and us all, don't be discouraged. You're almost there. What God is giving you requires preparation, focus, commitment and patience see discouragement is the enemy's favorite tool to use against you he knows there's a greatness inside of you and i think the thing that can get us there is mentioned right here the bible the bible b-i-b-l-e the basic instructions before leaving earth so let's stay the court let's stay the course and let's stay with jesus at this time, please join with me in prayer for the communion. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your mercy, your grace, and your love. Thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for your word. God, I pray right now that, God, you be with all the individuals who lost someone due to this pandemic in this year of 2020. Heal them, God. Help them in every way. God, as we take the juice, let us remember Jesus' blood. And as we take the bread, let us remember his body. God, we love you so much. We, we, we know that with you, all things are possible. And God, please continue to put it on our hearts to love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We need you. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank everyone so much for tuning in today. I love you all. And I wish you all a happy new year.
Good morning, family. Thanks so much uh, for spending your Sunday with us. I really hope and pray that you guys had a great Christmas and a great holiday season. I've got a couple of announcements coming up for you. Uh, the first announcement is, as always, uh, just please go out and check online at DetroitChurch.org. Find out all the different ways that you can give, whether that's electronically or, or by check or whatnot. Uh, please be sure to check that out. Also want to remind you that there's going to be a house church leaders meeting that's coming up next Saturday, January 2nd at 10 a.m. That's going to be held on Zoom. And so details will be forthcoming very soon to follow that. And then final announcement, just a reminder that we have our annual corporate meeting on January 27th. We'll be electing two new board members at that time. That's going to take place on Facebook Live at 7 p.m. So again, if you feel that you are uh, calling or uh, just urged to serve in that capacity, please let the leadership board know. You can reach out to Mark uh, or Sean Alexander or Clifton Brent and let them know of your interest and they can uh, discuss more with you from there. But again, that's January 27th at 7 p.m. So uh, that concludes today's service, guys. Uh, stay warm out there. Uh, love you and we'll see you in 2021.